Good morning and welcome to Life Church. My name is T.R. Stewart. I'm the youth and associate pastor here. We're glad you've chosen to join us today. Stay tuned. The Sunday experience is about to begin. Good morning. Is everyone ready? Can you believe it's December? How many of you have thought to yourself, it is December. I cannot believe it. Am I alone in that? Has anyone else thought that? Because, wow, this year is flying by. And I hear that happens when you're getting older. So I've been blaming my old age. But if you're young and you still feel that way, we still feel that way, right? Okay, it's not my old age. It's just something else. Let's all stand together this morning. Okay, for our first song, we're going to do a new song. And it really, if you don't participate, <laughs> we will look stupid. And you know, if you've ever been here to worship with me, you know I don't care that much about looking stupid. I'm willing to do it as often as is necessary. But today, we're going to start off with a little chant, and here are the words. They're really hard, so good luck, right? We're going to say this. Let everything, Let everything that has breath, that has breath praise, the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Right? Those are really hard. Who has ever heard those those words before? That's right. So we're going to do it. We're going to say it together, right? We're going to shout it out today because I am 98% sure that if you are here, if you came to church this morning, one thing that you have is breath, right? If you do not have breath, there are some medical professionals that are around here that will come to your aid, but you better fall loud because it's going to be loud. Okay? Got it? If I'm going to fall, I'll fall out, and embarrassingly. So, Jesus, we love you. We want to praise your awesome and mighty name today. We have breath. Thank you for the breath that you gave us. Thank you for waking us up every morning to be present with you, to worship you, to praise you because you are mighty, because you are good, because you are sovereign, because you are the king. We dedicate this service to you. This thing is for you. It is about you. And we are going to give all of our praise to you. Amen. Amen. Are you guys ready? Your part's coming up right now. Here we go. Let everything, Let everything that, has that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything, Let everything that, that has breath that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. One more time. Let everything. Let everything. Let everything. That has breath. That has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything. Let everything. That has breath. That has breath. Praise the Lord. 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 Praise the Lord.
Turn to your seats and stand with us again as we continue in our time of worship to the King. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again.
Don't you get shy on me to lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me to lift up your song.
Yeah. 
Lord Jesus, we ask that you would continue to be honored in what we do. God, may our lives reflect the work that you are doing in us. Thank you that you, you sent the Holy Spirit to be with us always, 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 everywhere we go. What a comforting thought it is that when we have Jesus, no matter where we go, no matter what kind of darkness we walk into, the light is with us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for making a way. It's such an honor to know you. It's such an honor to get to live my life for you. Thank you that you made a way. And that we get to remember how it all began in this season. We don't take that for granted. We love you. You alone are worthy. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Amen. Welcome all of our guests this morning. Can we do that right now? So glad you're here with us today. Again, um, we are delighted to have you. And so uh, also this morning before I go to preaching um, God's word, how many of you are excited about hearing something that God would have for you today? Amen. I, I, uh, I, I just want to let you know, uh, we want to thank you um, for your response to one day feed the world offering. And uh, we received, in that offering, we received over $4,000 uh, to go to One Day to Feed the World. And then um, Tom, our missions coordinator, saw we had some surplus in our giving to missions. And so we put another $2,000 toward that offering. So basically, our church is sending six, over $6,000 to Convoy of Hope. And so can we praise the Lord for that? Isn't that exciting? So awesome. So um, as you probably forgot, because we've had a few weeks in between, um, we're in a series in the life of David right now. And a few weeks ago, we left off looking at 1 Samuel chapter 24, and we're not going to be there today. Uh, we've already, we're kind of moving into 2 Samuel. But as we've been in this series called Heart Matters, and as we're going through 1 and 2 Samuel, it seems like almost every time you start another chapter, um, it seems like something else is happening in the life of David, and David is kind of, he's going up and down. How many of you know that's kind of like how life is? Sometimes life is, it's like it's really great when, you know, it, it throws you things that are, that are great, but then how many of you know that there's difficult times? And there's, there's hardship, there's, there's things that come along that are very, very hard to deal with. And, and David is kind of, in his life, in these chapters, he's kind of going up and down in these peaks and in these valleys. And, and in week one, uh, we saw David is in a lineup with all of his brothers and where they are all older, they are all better suited to be the king. And Samuel, the prophet of all prophets, picks David to be the next king of Israel. But yet, right after that, David is sent right back out to the sheep pen, back to the pastures to be a normal shepherd. I mean, you're going to be the king of Israel, uh, at least at some point. But right now, it's, hey, David, I want you to get back to flipping burgers. You know what I mean? So, and then so as we fast forward a little bit in the life of David, David enters the, the national stage. I mean, where he is sent out to check on his brothers one day and ends up seeing Goliath taunt 
all of Israel, and he ends up defeating Goliath. And all of this, all of that, it, it, it creates an instant fame. And, I mean, he, he gets to marry the king's daughter. Everyone knows the name David. He's a household name now. He uh, gets his, this job uh, working on Capitol Hill at the palace. I mean, he's working for the king, so to speak, working for King Saul. And at this point, all of this notoriety is creating some jealousy in Saul, the king. And so we saw in chapter 19 that there's one moment where David is kind of playing his music and he's singing to soothe Saul's soul. And it says the spirit of anger, envy, and rage came upon Saul. He was so angry. And he picks up a spear and he tries to impale David in a moment. So David, literally he becomes a man on the run and he's running from the king. And as the years pass, David is offered the possibility of taking a shortcut. And we talked about that a, a couple of three weeks ago. As Saul is uh, basically, just so you know, Saul is on his other throne um, in the cave. Some of you know that story. He's in a cave. Obviously that would have been an awkward moment. But David does the right thing. Even when the expectations are choked out by this little thing called reality where the king is supposed to be everybody's favorite, but he's not. David is now an enemy of the king. And David chooses obedience by not killing Saul while he's taking a bathroom break in a, a cave. Now, how many of you, I'm going to start this off this morning. I just kind of want to give you a little bit of review because I want you to understand it's been four weeks I had a little trouble trying to remember where we were because I know that the Lord had me, he wants me to do this. And so I'm going to be obedient. How many of you know that it's important to be obedient to the Lord? And so I want to be obedient. How many of you have ever heard of a place called Bucky's? Okay, here's an overview, uh, an overhead view of what you're, you're, you're talking about when people start talking about Bucky's. When you're on the highway, Bucky's is the iconic beaver that says, stop and don't just get some gas station food like great barbecue brisket sandwiches or their huge beef jerky section or their famous banana pudding or maybe even their homemade fudge or bakery sections. But one of the biggest things Bucky's promotes is when nature calls, and it will, we have the cleanest restrooms guaranteed. In fact, one of the billboards says it this way. It says this, top two reasons to stop at Bucky's is number one and number two. <laughs> Another one says this. It says, your throne awaits only 262 more miles, right? And I, listen, I, I was thinking about that. And, you know, not only while I was there this past summer, um, but more recently, isn't it just like us, the human race, to glorify the ordinary? And I'm saying this because, I mean, how can we overblow the, why is it that we overblow the average? I mean, why is it that we take something so simple and make something so grandiose about it, and we do that in life, and we do it in so many ways, and if you've flown a lot, how many of you have ever flown in, uh, uh, in an airplane? Raise your hand real high. How many of you have flown first class before? Raise your hand high. Okay, I'm just saying. Like if you, nowadays, if you fly first class, literally what that means is you get walnuts instead of peanuts, Right? <laughs> Or you get a plastic instead of a, a you get a, a glass cup instead of a plastic cup, right? Or, or, you know, the seat is just barely bigger, you know what I mean? Not really that much bigger. And then there's the, uh, how many of you are aware if you've ever not flown uh, 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 first class, um, how many of you are aware of the veil, the veil of the Holy of Holies, the place where you don't want to go? If you're not first class, you know what I mean? And so, you know, all the little people are in the back and the, big, the great people are in the front and you're up front and you're creme de la creme, you know what I mean? Uh, then in, the people in the back are, are suffering with peanuts, you know what I'm saying? While you're eating your warm almonds and your, and your walnuts. There is a sense in all of us that we want to feel like we're VIPs. I mean, there is a sense where, hey, you know, I, like somehow you and I deserve the greatest things ever. 
And, and every commercial for credit cards tells us that. I mean, how many of you recognize this, this commercial? You deserve the platinum life. Again, that, that's not necessarily a commercial. That's not necessarily a commercial that is actually uh, something that you would see nowadays. But listen, every c- commercial is patterned after this. Like, listen, you deserve everything that you get as long as it's really good. You should be treated like royalty. We're told this on virtually every billboard. I mean, we're told this in every commercial about how much life should be about us. Which actually, when you stop and think about it, it really presents a real challenge for Jesus' followers. I mean, it really does. I mean, it's like Paul Tripp said. He said, he put it this way. Human beings were created by God to be worshipers. And he says this. You cannot divide human beings into those who worship and those who don't. Everybody's worship, everybody worships. It's just a matter of what or whom we serve. I mean, so, so all of us, every single one of us, maybe you're here today and you're like, well, <laughs> you're, you're looking in on maybe Christianity Day and you're like, well, no, not me. Tony, I don't worship anything. I mean, Tony, I don't, I don't do any of that. Well, actually, listen, let me tell you something. You're here, you do. You probably don't think about it as worship, but really if you want to maybe identify it in your life a little bit better, what is it that is in your life that if it gets you rattled or if you have to do without it, it rocks your world? I mean, what are the things that make you angry? What are the things that make you cry? What are the things that, you know, what happens you're getting close to something in your life that becomes your idol? Listen, and if you don't have that, you're not happy. And while we may, you know, not necessarily bow down to an idol, per se, we certainly give ourselves over to it. And we do that by giving it a lot of money, by giving it a lot of our time. And listen, this this is the tension. This is amazing. Because for Jesus followers to break through a cultural thing that we all deal with, it's very hard. I mean, so the decision is this. The question is this. Who is the real king of your life? That's the question. Who's going to be the real king of your heart? I mean, who gets, let me ask you this, who gets veto power? Who gets to tell you no, or tell you yes, and you actually do something even if you don't want to do it. I mean, who or maybe should I say what can redirect your steps? I mean, listen, if it's not God and it's only you, that might be an indicator in your life. Listen, how many of you realize there can be times where um, literally, I've seen it before, where how many, how many of you have ever seen someone that is absolutely unteachable? Anybody ever seen that? How many of you are sitting by and raise your hand real high? Just kidding. (laughs) So, you know, I I have to say that there are some people that even though they would come to a church, they're unpastorable. Because listen, nobody is going to tell them what to do, right? How many of you have ever had that? You ever seen that? I'm saying, I'm not, listen, this is not reactive preaching for me. This is just preventive. I'm saying this. Because what happens is, is sometimes you got people that are like, there ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. And, you know, listen, you can sit there and say, hey, God says don't sleep with dogs because you might get fleas. And you, the person who, you, you, you know yourself, you're like, hey, you know what? They, you can tell me that in my life, but you go shack up in some doghouse somewhere because no one can tell you what to do. And so the reality is some of you, maybe even this morning, you are struggling ironically because how many of you know what I mean by when I say uh, it's like once we get to December, we like Christmassy messages? You know what I'm saying? And I'm gonna tell you that there is no more Christmassy message than the one I'm giving you right now. Who are you gonna bow down to, the king or, or yourself or everything else? So that's the real question. I mean, you look at it, I mean, uh, you know, and I'm talking about who's the real king of your life. And for some, it's a wrestling match because Jesus and a Christmas message with some Christmas music is not necessarily your thing. You really want that. You don't want 
what's this Jesus bowing down to the king stuff? I mean, I don't know about all that. I'd like to see some lights. You know what I'm saying? Um, So listen, when it comes to our choices and the things that we want and the things that we desire, you can tell a whole lot about who or what you're worshiping by seeing what fires you up. Listen, who gets veto power? Who is going to be king? And really, listen, this, this issue, it's the essence of worship. It's the essence of worship. I mean, Sarah has us lift our hands in worship sometimes. And, you know, I'm thinking instead, I mean, you're like, you know, maybe you're, you're listening to what she's saying. She, she said, hey, lift your hands. And if there's something, in, anything inside of you that says, man, I just want to sit down. I, I, you know, I just want to, I, 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 and you reluctantly lift your hands, or, or maybe last week you were like, man, I'm all in today, boy, I love the worship today, and boy, whoo, you know, but, but this week you're like, well, I didn't really like the songs this week. <laughs> like somehow we're the ones being worshiped. Is that not ironic? Is that not funny? It is funny. So certainly there is a, a tension in wor- worship sometimes trying to get past the human elements that we fight, even as we're fighting those even right now. I mean, there is tension. There is difficulty. Interestingly enough, interestingly enough this same tension in worship is the text we are looking at this morning. It's in the text that we're looking at today. Look at it in 2 Samuel 6, and the setting is this. David is now fully established as king over God, uh, God's people, Israel. And we've been following along as this shepherd boy is anointed to be king, but then he goes into ob- obscurity, into hiding in this long waiting period while Saul is gradually pushed out and because God's left him, so to speak. He's, he's basically taken the anointed off of Saul. Um, and, and really what's happened is in Saul's case, Saul has gotten too big on the inside for himself. I mean, and Saul has stopped recognizing the true king. And David, as he firmly establishes, uh, as he's being firmly established as king, David is like, as I come into this God-appointed setup, I want, I don't just want to be, the, I want God to be the king of Israel. That's what uh, David is saying. And so one of the first things he does is he asks about this, how, how the presence of the Lord would be in their midst. And, he, and, and at that time, literally what it was, was it was the Ark of the Covenant. And so to some of you, that might be some strange terminology, Ark of the Covenant. Maybe you only think that that's Indiana Jones and the Temple of Dune talk. Maybe you're here and you don't really know what about the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was actually a, 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 a chest, and it's a box. It was um, um, in the most holy place in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, and it came from the law of Moses. And it was a a place where God essentially says, hey, I'm going to meet with you. I'm going to meet with one priest one day, one time a year, and this high priest would go into a, a room no one went into before this box and would sprinkle blood on this box. And it was like, it all seemed very weird and very mysterious, but this was all to foreshadow something that would actually take place in the New Testament. And so where where these, and where these angels spread uh, spread their wings like over like this on the top of this box, right under their wings, we call that the mercy seat. And God would say this, God would say, this is where I will speak to you and I will talk with you. And and so uh, the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. I mean, and it had a few things in it. It had the Ten Commandments in it. It had uh, Aaron's running, uh, budding rod. Um, it also had a bowl of manna. And, and that was to say, this, God is saying, this is my covenant with my people. I'm going to do miraculous things before you. I'm going to do supernatural things. I'm going to work with you. And so this box is a representation of the place that I'm going to meet with you, God says. And so David is like, you know what? I want... When he becomes king, he says, I want this representation, I want this to be in the capital city. I want it to be in Jerusalem. Now that I'm in charge, he says, I want God to be the true king over Israel, not me. And so, in fact, just so you have a good idea about the difference between Saul and David, 
Uh, and, and because, listen, how many of you realize, again, this series, the whole point of this series is the fact that heart matters. The, the whole point of the, the series we've been talking about is that it's not just what you see on the outside. It's not just about doing stuff on the outside. Uh, but I want you to see the difference between Saul and David. Uh, Saul never even asked about the ark except for one time. Not one time. And the only reason he asked was because they were in trouble in a battle and he wanted to know where it was so that they could start winning. I mean, listen, is, isn't it interesting that the first thing that David does is he asks about that. I mean, we want to bring, David's like, we want to bring God on her back. David's like, we want to bring the true king back. I mean, so, so David plans this day, plans this procession, and, and we read about it in 2 Samuel, and as he's creating this procession into town with music and with symbols and priests and robes, as he's doing all of this and all of Israel is watching, all of a sudden, David does something very unusual and very, very strange. David suddenly takes off his crown. He begins to take off his kingly robes. Some of you are like, are you really going to do that? No, I'm not. I started to, but then I thought, oh, wait, I don't have the right shirt on underneath. Oh, wait, maybe I don't. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Sunday, fun day. Anyway, so that's probably not the right shirt, but anyway, um, you know, so as he's doing that, as he's creating this procession into town, all these priests, all these robes, he takes off his crown, he takes off his kingly robes uh, and puts on this priestly ephod, if you will. Basically, what we're talking about is the simple linen garment. And it says that David, what does he do? He dances before the Lord with all of his might. Look at it in 2 Samuel 6. It says this, and David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. I mean, so imagine Picture it, if you will. The Ark of the Covenant, carried by the Levites, as it's supposed to be, carried with these poles on the shoulders of the Levitical priesthood, coming into town, David the king, right there before the Ark, David is dancing with all of his might. David is just cutting a rug. I mean, everyone is celebrating except at least one person that we know of who instead is looking from the window up above on a second story window. And the Bible says she's the queen. Michael was her name. And we don't know, maybe she has her feet up. Maybe she is looking from this window and she's got her a glass of wine. She's got her a, maybe a cup of tea uh, with her favorite princess silk robe on. And the Bible says she's the daughter of, the, of Saul, the former king. And now she's the wife of King David. And the reason she's his wife was because David defeated Goliath. And the scripture says, interestingly enough, it says this, it says, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And this is what she thought. What a man, what a man, what a man, what a mighty good man. <laughs> what, a, what a warrior for God, right? My studly man king, right? And just so everyone knows, my man can dance too. <laughs> you know, so, but no, that's not what she says. Rather, the Bible says this, that she despised him in her heart. That's what she did. I mean, the word, I want you to know, if you look at the word and you've studied the languages behind this, the word is, is, is in the English language, it's the word contempt. There's, basically it's like this. She sees all that happening and there's a, a rolling of the eyes. There's a sneer. I can't stand it when he does that. I, I literally, it's not just being sarcastic. It's not just being funny. She's like literally, she, it, her perspective is this. This is very unbecoming, uh, unbecoming of someone who's supposed to be of royalty. 
He's not supposed to be like this. She's, she's very much coming from the stance that says this, that I did not ask for this. This is not what I wanted. This is not appropriate activity for kings and queens of our caliber because we are awesome like that. That's what we are, and you shouldn't act like that. And so, listen, the Bible says she despises him. And by the way, it's also interesting because she isn't out on the street. She's not out on the street with everybody singing and dancing. She's looking from a second story window. And the truth is, is here's the deal. She does not get it. She doesn't get it at all. And unfortunately, she's showing here that she's really her father's daughter. King Saul. That's very much where she's at. I mean, you look at it, and I mean, you can see the, the story kind of evolve here. And so, unfortunately for, for her, ironically, the writer knows this about her too, because of if you look at Luke at, uh, if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 16 again, it says, As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, look at what it says. It says, Michael, the who? Why not the why not the wife of David? It doesn't say that. It says the daughter of Saul. She looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. So notice the writer doesn't call her David's wife. He calls her daughter of Saul. Isn't that a signal? I mean, so, so again, she's got her father's heart rather than a heart like David. And we're talking about literally what is going on on the inside. Okay, it's one thing for you to do stuff on the outside. Listen, it's a whole other matter for what's happening on the inside. And here, David, the shepherd, the songwriter, the king, what is he doing? He's dancing with all of his might before the Lord. And Michael is up on her high horse, looking through the window. She's in judgment. And the question becomes of us is this. What about you? Where are you in this story? I mean, and, and so I think sometimes I'm David, and I want to talk to you just for a second about worship. And, and I want to talk to you for a second about literally where that worship comes from. It's, called, it's, it's the idea of worth-ship. I mean, I think sometimes, literally, I know I'm David. But then there are moments in our lives. How many of you have ever had a moment in your life where you feel like you're kind of like Michael sometimes? Where it's like, you know, you're looking from your window, kind of being judgmental. What's the thing we do every Sunday? I mean, where we gather, it's, it's, it's worship. We're worshiping. We're, we're, we're translating that as worship. And so really, whether it's Sunday or not, we are attributing worth to someone. We are attributing, attributing worth, uh, worth to something. And we say this someone or this something or has, has greater value. And so what, what am I doing? I am attributing worth to it. Just so you know, David is showing his adoration by dancing with all of his might, exchanging his kingly robes, exchanging the purple in his crown, laying that aside. What's he saying? In reality, David's saying this. I know, God, you've appointed me king, but I'm really not the king. You're the king. I'm not the king, God, I, I, you're the king, and, and I want you to be in this place, so I'm going to lay aside my kingly robes, and I'm going to put on the garment of praise, and I, because there is someone, big, big S, that who is worthy of my worship. He is all that in a box of chocolate. He is everything that I need. God is all that. And so my question is, is where are we? Where are we? Some of you are like, yeah, it's a struggle today. I know, I get it, I understand. I understand right now, I understand. What I don't understand is that, listen, is it really about him right now? That's the question. I mean, so, so listen, David comes home and he's in this celebration and listen, he's sweaty, he's so excited, he's you know, he's welcomed the real king basically back into Jerusalem. The presence of God is back. I mean, and so God is now back in the sacred tent and so where it's supposed to be. And David comes home and like he's supposed to do and he blesses his family and he's saying nice things. And what does Michael say? I mean, I would like to think she would say, well, what a great celebration. I'm so proud of you. 
I'm so glad we're serving a living God. But that's, you know, that's not what happens. I mean, you can almost hear the cynicism in her voice. And the Bible catches it. So she sarcastically says this. She says, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. I mean, that's one of the nicest ways to put somebody down that I've ever seen. But really, that's what she's doing. How the king of Israel honored himself today. Uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. Listen, if you study this, he's not getting naked. Some of, the, some of you have maybe gone online and tried to figure this out, and it's not that. Literally, the ephod is not just the piece that would go on the breastplate of a priest. Listen, the ephod was a whole entire garment. You have an undergarment that he's wearing. And so, listen, and so you have this perspective and, 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 and you can hear it in her voice. How many of you can hear the sneer in her voice? I mean, the sarcasm, if you will. And so what, is, and what does David say? Verse 21 essentially says this. He says, you know what? I want you to know something, uh, Michael. It's really great that you're so unproud of me. But listen, I wasn't dancing for you. I was dancing for one. Look at it in verse 21. David says to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will celebrate, who will I celebrate before? I will celebrate before the Lord. Now some of you are gonna be like, you know, so PT, are you saying that we need to have more dancing in church? Is that what you're saying? I mean, you, I mean, we really need to dance more. That's what needs to happen. That's what I mean. The, the Pentecostal fire needs to come down from heaven and we just need to dance a whole lot more. Listen, let me give you a disclaimer, okay? Let me, let me let you understand it. I've seen a lot of re- wedding receptions in Lyon County, Morris County, Chase County, really all over Kansas. And some of you really need to keep your dancing private into yourself. <laughs> some of you, I'm sorry, some of you are a cross between like Kevin James and Elaine Bennett, you know, from Seinfeld, I don't know. Uh, I'm just saying. A lot of times, I'm just saying this, a lot of times Terry and I just, we just end up going home, skip the rest of the reception, because a lot of times, you know, what it amounts to is people, listen, I'm, I'm just going to say it, people worship alcohol, people worship a lot of things they shouldn't worship, and really all that amounts to is this, they're really worshiping themselves because all they, they want to feel better than they want to actually, listen, I didn't want to be drunk at my wedding because my wife was the most beautiful thing you ever saw. So I'm just saying this. I'm looking at this from this perspective like, you know, uh, that's beside the point. I'm kind of getting, I started thinking about my wife on our wedding day. Whew, boy, I'm having to cool down a little bit. But listen, Terry's back there going, I'm going to get you back. The point is this. What's going on in your heart? I mean, so when you see someone, listen, I'm just saying this. When you see someone weep before the Lord, when you see someone kneel, when you see someone get a little bit, how many of you ever seen somebody get a little too excited for Jesus and in a moment they just, I'm sorry, we were in a church service one time and I got so tickled. It It was not funny, but it was funny. The person got so excited and they started running and then when they cut the corner, they missed you know, and but they got right back up and kept going, you know what I mean? And so they were just excited for Jesus, you know what I'm saying? And so they were just worshiping by running in a moment. And listen, I, I'm going to tell you something. Listen, all of us, it's really not about everything you see on the outside. And listen, am I saying that we should just all do whatever? I'm not saying that because we do have a prescription for worship. We do have a, if you look up one uh, Psalm, um, we're going to be talking about this in our small groups this week. If you look up Psalm 147 through 150 and you read all of that, you will see how many of you think that we're supposed to clap our hands and shout to God with a voice of triumph? How many of you know that? How many, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to lift holy hands. We're supposed to praise him. We're supposed to kneel. We're supposed to lie down on the ground before him. I mean, listen, there's all these things that we could do. But listen, that is not what it's about. That's only the actuation of what's going on inside. And so um, I, I kind of think of it this way. If, if we're all created to worship How many of you realize that the person you're sitting by is probably different than you? And they probably have a different personality than you? 
And so we, our, our, the question becomes this. What's going on in your heart? Are you the person that you're, you're feeling this impulse to say this? There's somebody behind all of this. I mean, think about it. You stand at the Grand Canyon. You stand at the Grand Canyon and you look at that and you go, oh, wow, I'm so brave. Is that really what you're going to say when you're standing there? Or I'm such an idiot <laughs> standing on the edge. No, listen, when I get next to something like that, I'm like going, how great thou art. <laughs> how great you are, God that you would create something like this. And listen, yes, I know that erosion is used in that. But listen, understand this. We serve a God who is actually able to create. And so, wow, unbelievable. When you stand and you look at the moon and the stars and you see it and you're like, all the galaxies, there's someone greater out there than you and me. And I, today, I worship him with all my heart. And so, or maybe... When you see the rain coming down, and you don't just sit there and go, hmm, that's interesting. Listen, when I sit down to eat lunch or dinner, I don't just say, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food, amen, and I'm done. Listen, instead, I'm like, man, God, you're, you've been so good to me. You're so amazing. You've provided this food. Thank you for these provisions. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for this food, especially this chocolate cake that's about to go down, oh Jesus. You are such a wonderful provider, oh God. Everything that we have, it comes from you. How many of you know what I mean? So, and really, the question becomes this. What gets your heart dancing? What gets your heart dancing? Well, nothing really, PT. All right. Don't make me call you a liar. Because people will, they'll, listen, you, <laughs> if you spend any time around a person at all, you will eventually find out what gets, gets them fired up. Some of you, just the fact that I say, Rock, Chuck, J, Hawk. See what I mean? <laughs> Woo! Right? You know? We're talking about, listen, what makes your heart pound? What makes your heart race? I mean, don't tell me that never happens. What makes you angry? What makes you weep? What, what makes you give high five to complete strangers at a Chiefs game? Why in the world would you do that? But you do. COVID goes out the window. You're like, I don't care. We just scored a touchdown or a Royals game or listen, a KU or a K-State game. Listen, I understand. Yet when we come to worship... That's not really that impressive, Sarah. <laughs> Do a little more and I might get excited. Yeah, really? Okay, well, whatever. I mean, listen, is that who you're here for? We're not here for... I, I, <laughs> you come here to see me, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> That's pretty sad. If you come here to see, you know, worship... Listen, we're here to worship the King of kings and the Lord. He is great and mighty and he's to be praised He's, um, I mean, listen, he pulled you out of the mire, you uh, clay. Do you re realize what he did for you? I mean, wow. And then we sit around acting like God needs to impress us. And listen, I get it. Maybe you're not the party guy or the party girl. Maybe you're not the person that's, you know, you're, maybe you're more introverted than that. And I get it. You're, you're probably not going to be in the middle of the dance floor at weddings either, thankfully. You know, but again, I'm not asking if you have a certain kind of personality, and if you don't, then you need to ask God for another one. I'm not saying that. Rather, what I'm asking is, is this, what goes on in your heart? What goes on in your heart when you see somebody lift their hands in worship and they're genuine? What goes on in your heart when you see people vibrantly worship? And so maybe you, you, they get a little carried away, or maybe they are a little crazier than you. What goes on in your heart? And listen, I want, want, to, want to ask you this question. What if David knows something that Michael doesn't? What if
if David knows something about what he's doing in that moment that Michael doesn't know? What if David knows that worship, it actually paves the way for God's presence to come in greater measure? I mean, so what if David is enjoying fellowship with God in heaven and, you know, in an intimate way, maybe he's experiencing this in a moment while he's dancing before this box, so to speak. I mean, so listen, he has uncovered an intimate way to be close to God than he's ever been before. That worship is a way to God's heart. I mean, I've always loved music, and music is a part of my life, and, and I play several instruments, and I'm, if the Lord hadn't, wasn't involved, this is not me bragging to you, this is me just telling you, if the Lord wasn't involved in that, there would be no playing, because it's, I've not worked a day of my life for that. I had multiple piano teachers quit me, because they would play the song, and then I would play it right after them, because I, I could just watch, I could just hear it, and I don't know how, that's God. But in the summer of 1994, Terry and I came back to see our parents. Uh, we went to Tulsa to see her parents for the holidays, uh, Christmas, and then went to Oklahoma City to see mine. And um, I, Terry and I wanted to visit uh, an up-and-coming church because we hadn't been there before. It wasn't necessarily Pentecostal, uh, but it was a good church. They preached the gospel. And there, they had a, a lot of different worship leaders um, there at the time. The church had so much talent. They had like 14 different worship bands, which was crazy, about 16 or 17 different worship leaders, very skilled. The church was called Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City. And Terry and I were sitting in worship, and we were back, the, the church, the building would be like three of these back. And we were in the, this section all the way to the back. And I'll never forget when we came in, they were starting worship and they had, and so, you know, we kind of joined in and just started lifting our hands and praising the Lord. And, and uh, at some point in the worship service, there was a person that came to the microphone and says, at this time, if there are people that have needs before the Lord, we're going to, we're going to pray for him. And all of a sudden, these uh, six or seven, I don't know, older dudes got up, came down front, and uh, people were coming down there, and they were getting laid, hands laid on them. They were getting prayed for. But then after that, they started into another worship song, and when all the praying was done, um, all the elders, I, I you know, basically, uh, one of the elders was right here. And, you know, I had pretty much a straight shot. And how many of you have ever um, been in a church service where all of a sudden people are dancing and they're all excited? I'm not, I'm not saying just dancing, dancing, but I mean, this was a little different. This was like this. Like, how many of you know that dance that you do this with? But they were spinning, and I'm not good at dancing, so my family makes fun of me, of me for it all the time. I'm not a dancer, but anyway, they, they were just dancing and going like this. And I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking... That's different. And I looked at Terry. She looked at me. I was like, we both thought the same thing. That was different. And uh, at one point, there was a girl that had raised her hand, and I saw she had been missed that in prayer. So Terry and I didn't want anybody to <laughs> not be prayed for. So we came down a little closer. The closer I got, the guy down here that was doing this dance, this was convicting, folks. The guy that was doing this dance that I'm judging about whether or not he should be doing that dance before the Lord had tears streaming down his face. And the closer I got, the more I realized all of them were crying. It wasn't sweat, it was tears. They were just worshiping. And here's the song they were singing. They were singing this. You are the king of kings, you are the Lord of lords. My one heart's desire is you. You are the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. My heart, one heart's desire. The guy, the guy that wrote it was a guy named Josh Banner. He was the one that was actually singing the song. And I will never forget in my heart of hearts, I was so convicted. I mean, the Lord did something. Listen, the Lord did something to me that day. And I felt the Lord pricking my heart about how sometimes God's people, what we do is we kind of grow up. We think we're growing up by, so to speak, if we will, and we can become too big for our britches. That's a Southern saying, by the way. I mean, you know what that means, too big for your britches. Um, you know, um, you can, and I'm not talking about you just gained weight. I mean, uh, 
We, we become a little bit cynical and we kind of have this attitude about like how, you know, well, that's fine for them and they can look like a fool for Jesus, whatever, bless their heart, you know what I mean? But I, I'm, I, I'm more prim and proper than that. I'm refined, I'm a refined believer, right? And listen, I'm not saying we're, you know, all the same, but let me ask you this question. Does your heart dance? Does your heart dance? I've been judged before by what I did on the outside, both directions, by more than one group of people. And I'm not talking about just as a pastor, but some of you think that the only thing that matters is what's on the outside, and that couldn't be further from the truth. And if that's you, you could be in danger of making that a show. And listen, I don't want to be a show in front of Jesus because Jesus knows whether it's a show or not. And so, but some of you, you maybe you've been judged by so-called spiritual people, self-proclaimed spiritual people who notice when you don't raise your hands. Well, I noticed that you didn't raise your hands today. Self-proclaimed spiritual people saying that who seem to lift their hands at the drop of a hat and that, that, you know, they're super spiritual, you know, and we're just, I'm just wondering why you didn't today. Well, listen, how many of you know this? You could lift your hands and do everything in church and and make it look great, but you could still be not worshiping God alone at home and sleeping around or doing whatever you want, living in sin. You could do that all day long. And so listen, again, the outside is not what's important. Even though we were encouraged to do these things, Psalm 147 through 150, that's what we're going to be looking at in our small groups. But listen, if you have Jesus, you've received more than, imagine, uh, today, if when you walked out the door, a limo pulls up and says, um, Steve, uh, I just wanted to, you to know, um, I've got this box of money right here for you guys, and it's a million dollars, it's cash, right? Or, or maybe, maybe it's not that, maybe it's like, you know, um, somebody comes up and they say, Tony, uh, I just want you to know. Uh, we stopped by the bank on Friday and we paid off all your debt. How many of you would say today, if you were to walk out and somebody gave you a million dollars or somebody paid off all your debt, it wouldn't cause you to want to worship Jesus for a second? Anybody in here? How many of you would love that? How many of you are going to be looking now outside for a limo? Okay, I'm just saying. So, I mean, the reality is, is this. If you have Jesus... You have so much more than that limo pulling up. You've received more than the paid off mortgage. You've received more than a a Super Bowl berth. You've received more uh, than your favorite college team making a bowl game. You've received more than a few extra coins in the coffer just to make it, you know, you've, you've received grace from a king who didn't need anything from you but chose to give it and to bestow it upon you anyway. But he was like, I want you. I desire you. Yeah, I know. I don't need you. I know there's nothing in you that you could make me want or need you. God says, but listen, I choose you. And he sent his son to take your place, all of the debt of sin, and gave you mercy by saving us. And listen, so that we get to enter heaven by the most holy place. And I think of it this way, and it says this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 22. And listen, we're going to enter God's most holy place. Look at it. And it says this, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened us for us through the curtain. In other words, how many of you know this, what this means? It means we don't need a box anymore. It means that we don't, we don't need the Ark of the Covenant anymore because now the presence of God is with us through his son. You don't have to be a priest because listen, Jesus is your high priest. So we can go right into the presence of God. We can go right into his, his throne room and we can just begin to worship him in spirit and in truth. And it says this, that that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from all evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And with whatever personality you have, that something stirs at, at, at the thought that I can go before God, that I can not be ashamed when I walk into his presence because he's not ashamed to call me his kid and he welcomes me into his presence. Isn't God worth some expression? I mean, so worship is an attitude of the heart. 
And really, this is the problem with Michael because I think Michael, her, her heart stopped beating way before 2 Samuel chapter 6. I mean, her heart had hardened long before this. It had calcified. And certainly, yes, worship does begin in the heart. But just like Michael's lack of worship came out of her in cynicism, in sneers, it can't help but come out of a true worshiper either and express itself. Just, I'm, I'm just going to say this. It's like a person in love. <laughs> we have anybody in here that's in love? <laughs> I love it. I love it when people are in love. <laughs> Honey snookums. <laughs> Buttercup, right? <laughs> Baby. It's like all these names we call each other. I just saw all the husbands put their hands around their wives just now. You know. Listen, I'm just saying this. There's something special about that. Worship begins in the heart. I, I love this. D David says in Psalm 22, he says this, and, and that no longer is there a room. Basically, you, there's no longer a room where you have to go into a room to actually worship God. Where, where a priest goes in once a year, and but now... Wherever God is praised, he's, he can, God sets his throne up on top of that praise. Can, can I tell you this? I'm going to say that again. Some of you need to hear this. I had two people walk up to me beforehand, and they talk about something that's going on wrong in their life. And hear me right now. Don't come up to me afterwards and say the same thing over and over again. Do this. Wherever you're at, if you have something going on in your life that's bad, Listen, let me tell you something. Just begin to praise the Lord. Because the Bible says that he enthrones, he's enthroned on the praises of his people. So what happens is, is God comes in in that moment right where you're at, right in the middle of that pain or right in the middle of that difficulty or right in the middle of that hardship. And here's the thing. God puts his presence. It's like he's enthroned on the praises of his people. The moment that you begin to praise him, I believe that the presence of God comes in and makes everything right. I believe that God, listen, and you may still have things be going wrong, but listen, his presence is there. He is there with you. And I mean, whether that be the, the fourth man in the fire or whether that be with uh, Daniel and the lion's den, listen, he's able to shut the mouth of the lion. He's able to do anything. And so as Sarah and the team come back, most of you know that this time of year, for the last 30 years, it has been super tough time for my family. If you've been around my family at all during the holidays, for those that don't know, um, my dad, years ago, uh, pastoring a church, left my mom, ran off with another woman. Uh, my mom was so devastated. And just this year, God did a miracle. Some of you that know, God did a miracle. My dad went this summer, late summer, went and apologized to my mom. And my mom and her husband now go to my dad's church, and this last weekend where I was, you guys were up here, down, or yeah, up here having eight inches of snow, and I was down there preaching a sermon at, because they asked me to come and preach at their church, and here's my mom and my, uh, Doug is his name, and then uh, here's my dad and his wife, and here we are, and we're preaching this message, and I'm like, you know, I'm preaching about peace. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Peace of God. And so I'm preaching this message, and I'm going to tell you something, that when God does something miraculous, it's amazing. And so we're all going out to dinner, and I'm thinking, you know, no big deal. We're going to go to dinner, and there's uh, uh, 20, 20 seats at this table in this packed restaurant that we're going to and there's four seats left and it's me Terry my mom and then her husband Doug and I sound like I don't like Doug I love Doug but anyway <laughs> it's just really awkward I just don't know what to do like what do you do with all this you know what I'm saying like there's forgiveness and like I've been for 30 years I've been like we haven't been in the same room together for you know I can't tell you when but how many of you know when God gets involved he's able to work and I'll never forget, some of you don't know the, how many of you know the Balaquis? Balaquis. Okay. If you don't know the Balaquis, Alfie texted me this time last year, and he just texted me out of nowhere, and he says this. He says, Tony, I have felt like the Lord laid on my heart to pray for your dad. And I'm thinking, how in the world does 
Alfie even know about my dad? That's a long time. Alfie was a youth staff a long time ago when I was a youth pastor. And so Alfie just starts telling me, he says, I felt like God wanted me to pray for your dad. And Alfie came back this last week to visit to say hi. And I, I, I brought him in the room. I was bringing him around, just showing him all the changes that the church has been through. Well, as we're talking, I said, by the way, I want you to know, remember the text you sent me last year? He says, yeah. He, I said, my dad went back to my mom and apologized. And now my mom goes to the church there and that there's been healing and there's, there's deli- I mean, it's, it's amazing. Like literally, we're all in the same room. Well, there's this table that we're at at lunch and, and literally there's four seats left and one of them is right across from my dad. And I said, okay, mom, I'm gonna let you decide where you wanna sit. And so my 76-year-old mother starts walking over. I think she's gonna take the end of the table so she didn't have to sit across from my dad. She sits down right across from me. <laughs> and so I'm just like, what in the world? You know what I mean? Like, here's the thing. The presence of the Lord does a lot. The presence of the Lord does a lot. The presence of the Lord is awesome. And right now, what I want us to do, this is very different, but I feel like there are some folks here. I'm not saying I just feel it, but I sense it in my spirit. There are some folks here that have some situations. You got some stuff going on in your life and you're like going, I just don't know what to do. Let me tell you something, I do. Begin to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I'm not saying that's all you're doing it for, but listen, there is something about God's presence coming down in a room and doing things that we could never ever do on our own. There is no way you could conjure up making God heal somebody. There's no way you could conjure up the ability for, to see what happened in my own family. Listen, I'm telling you, it is as awkward as can be going to family events now because we're all having, we don't have two Christmases anymore. We don't have two Thanksgivings anymore. Now we got one. It's weird. But I'm catching up because here's the thing. God is worthy of all praise. God is a healer. Can he fix everything that's happened? No, he can't. But listen, let me tell you something. He is making lemonade out of lemons right now. And God is working. I want you to do something. I want you to stand with me right now, right where you're at. I want you just to begin to lift your hands to heaven. We're gonna begin to worship the Lord. We're gonna begin to praise the name of Jesus. We're gonna begin to give him praise. And maybe you're here today and you'd say, you know what? I got stuff going on in my life and I'm needing some of the people to pray for me this morning. You just come right down here while the people are praising. While God, if you wanna come down here and praise, whatever you need to do, but I'm gonna have the elders come. I'm gonna have you guys come and grab this oil. Tom, Ray, I'm gonna throw this to you. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna, I'm just saying, if you need prayer today, God is here to meet your need today. But right now, I want us just to begin to lift our hands. And can we just right now, right where you're at, just begin to lift your hands right now, right where you're at. Just begin to worship the King of Kings. Maybe that's uncomfortable for you. You just bow your heart today. God, we just worship you today in this place. Lord, we are here and we wanna be people like David. We don't want to be like Michael. We don't want to be sneering and looking and seeing people, other people uh, worshiping, but we have a heart that is not thankful or grateful. God, we're asking, Lord, in this moment right now that, God, that you would set some people free in this place by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would just begin to, to shake loose the, the bonds, the, uh, the chains that maybe are on folks, God. Maybe today you would just break that. And Lord, that you would let them know, let people in this room know how much you love them and how much you want to change them and how much you want to work in their life. And Lord, how much you want to be involved in every going on in their life, oh God. Lord, and today, because of all that, we worship you, God. We give you praise in this place, oh God. Just begin to tell him right now. Can you do that? Can you begin to tell him how great he is in your life?